Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Wyatt and Megan for inviting me here. I want to thank all of the writers uh, at this conference for making the days go by so quickly that, and in such, I mean, there's not enough time to hear the work and have the conversations, but enough time to make us remember each other and want more. So uh, please accept my thanks. Um, tonight we're gonna do uh, uh, two selections or three selections, short selections from an oldie, How I Learned to Drive. Um, it's, <laughs> it's been a long time since uh, I've actually heard How I Learned to Drive, although last month I was in China in Beijing, where they performed How I Learned to Drive in Mandarin. <laughs> I think it was my play. <laughs> but, so, um, and then I'm gonna just get up and talk a little bit about the second selection. Um, but please welcome to the stage, it's been an incredible delight to have them, uh, Lucas Dixon and Sharice Castro-Smith. <laughs> Safety first, you and driver education. Sometimes, to tell a secret, you have to first teach a lesson. We're gonna start our lesson today on an early warm summer evening in a parking lot overlooking the Beltsville Agricultural Farms in suburban Maryland. Less than a mile away, the crumbling concrete of US-1 wends its way past one-room revival churches, the porno drive-in, and boarded up motels with for sale signs tumbling down. Like I said, it was a warm summer evening. Here on land the Department of Agriculture owns, the smell of sleeping farm animal is thick on the air. The smells of clover and hay mix in with the smells of the leather dashboard. You can still imagine how Maryland used to be before the malls took over. The countryside was once dotted with farmhouses. From their porches, you could have witnessed the Civil War raging in the front fields. Oh yes, there's a moon over Maryland tonight that spills into the car where I sit beside a man old enough to be. Did I mention how still the night is? Damp soil and tranquil air. It's the kind of night that makes a middle-aged man with a mortgage feel like a country boy again. It's 1969 and I am very old, very cynical of the world and I know it all. In short, I am 17 years old. <laughs> Parking off a dark lane with a married man on an early summer night. Hmm, I love the smell of your hair. Uh-huh. Oh, Lord. Mm hmm. <laughs> A man could die happy like this. Well, don't. <laughs> what shampoo is this? Herbal essence. Herbal essence. I'm going to buy me some herbal essence. <laughs> when I'm all alone in the house, I'm going to get in the bathtub and uncap the bottle and... Be good. What? Stop being bad. What did you think I was going to say? What do you think I'm going to do with the shampoo? I don't know. I don't want to hear it. I'm going to wash my hair. <laughs> That's all. Oh. What did you think I was going to do? Nothing. I don't know. Something nasty. <laughs> with shampoo? Lord, gal, you're mine. Whose fault is that? <laughs> Not mine. I've got the mind of a Boy Scout. Right. A horny Boy Scout. Boy Scouts are always horny. <laughs> what do you think the first merit badge is for? There, you're going to be nasty again. Oh, no. I'm good. I'm very good. 
It's getting late. Don't change the subject. I was talking about how good I am. Are you ever going to let me show you how good I am? Don't go over the line now. I won't. I'm not going to do anything you don't want me to do. That's right. And I've been good all week. You have? Yes. All week. Not a single drink. Good boy. Do I get a reward for not drinking? A small one. It's getting late. Just let me undo you. I'll do you back up. All right. But be quick about it. You know, that's amazing, the way you can undo the hooks through my blouse with one hand. Years of practice. <laughs> you would make an amazing brain surgeon with that dexterity. I'll bet Clyde. What's the name of the boy taking you to the prom? Claude Sauters. Claude Sauters. I bet he takes him two hands, lights on, and you helping him to get to first base. <laughs> Maybe. Can I kiss them? Please? I don't know. Don't make a grown man beg. Just one kiss. I'm going to lift your blouse. It's a little cold. <laughs> That's not why you're shivering. How does that feel? It's OK. Sacred music, organ music, or a boy's choir swells beneath the following. I tell you, you can keep all the cathedrals of Europe. Just give me a second with these, these celestial orbs. <laughs> Uncle Peck, we've got to go. I've got graduation rehearsal at school tomorrow morning, and you should get on home to Aunt Mary. All right, little bit. Don't call me that no more, anymore. I'm a big girl now, Uncle Peck, as you know. That you are. Going on 18. Kittens will turn into cats. I live all week long for these few minutes with you. You know that. I'll drive. Idling in the neutral gear, Uncle Pet teaches Cousin Bobby how to fish. I get back once or twice a year, supposedly to visit Mama and the family, but the real truth is to fish. I miss this most of all. There's a smell in the low country where the swamp and fresh inlet join the salt water, a scent of sand and cypress that I haven't found anywhere yet. I don't say this very often up north because it'll just play into the stereotype everyone has, but I will tell you, I didn't wear shoes in the summertime until I was 16. <laughs> it's unnatural down here to pin up your feet in leather. Go ahead, take them off. Let yourself breathe. It really will make you feel better. We're going to aim for some pompano today. And I have to tell you, they're a very shy, mercurial fish. It takes patience and psychology. You have to believe it doesn't matter if you catch one or not. The sky is pretty spectacular. There's some beer in the cooler next to the crab salad I pack, so help yourself if you get hungry. Are you hungry? Thirsty? Holler if you are. Okay, you don't want to lean over the bridge like that. The pompano feed in shallow water, and you don't want to get too close. They're frisky and shy little things. Wait, check your line. Yeah, something's been munching while we were talking. Okay, look, we take the sand flea and you take the hook like this right through his little sand flea rump. <laughs> sand fleas should always keep their backs to the wall. <laughs> okay, cast it in <laughs> like I showed you. That's great. Now I can taste that pompano now, sauteed with some pecans and butter, a little bourbon. Now, let it lie on the bottom. Now, real jerk, real jerk, look. Look at your line. Now, there's something calling, all right. Okay, I tip the rod up, not too sharp. Hook it. All right, now easy. Reel and then rest. Now let it play. And reel, play it out. That's right. Really good. I can't believe it. It's a pompano. <laughs> good work. Way to go. You are an official fisherman now. Pompano are hard to catch. 
We're going to have a delicious little. What? Well, I don't know how much pain a fish feels. You can't think of that. Oh, no, now don't cry. Come on now, it's just a fish. The other guys are going to see you. No, no, you're just real sensitive, and I, I think that's wonderful at your age. Look, you want me to cut it free? You do? Okay, well, hand me those pliers. Look, I'm cutting the hook, okay? And we're just going to drop it in. No, I'm, I'm not mad. It's just for fun, okay? There. It's going to swim back to its lady friend and tell her what a terrible day it had, and she's going to stroke him with her fins until he feels better, and then they'll do something alone together that will make them both feel good and sleepy. <laughs> I don't want you to feel ashamed about crying. I'm not going to tell anyone, okay? I can keep secrets. You know, men cry all the time. They just don't tell anybody and they don't let anybody catch them. There's nothing you could do that would make me feel ashamed of you. Do you know that? Okay. You want to pack up and call it a day? I tell you what, I think I can still remember. There's a really neat tree house where I used to stay for days. I think it's still here. It was, it was the last time I looked, but it's a secret place. You can't tell anyone we've gone there, least of all your mom or your sisters. This is something special just between you and me. Sound good? We'll climb up there and have a beer and some crab salad. Okay, B.B.? Bobby? Robert? So um, I wrote The Long Christmas Ride, and just uh, something I want to sort of set up for you is that uh, the play actually has two narrators and life-size Bunraku puppets for the children in the back seat. Um, <coughs> here's what it says. The adult actors who play the adult children, that would be the characters of Claire, Rebecca, and Stephen, begin as puppeteers in the back seat of the car. Uh, but they grow into narrators of their own, able to narrate and manipulate their memories. They may also manipulate their parents, like puppets, at the end of the play. Uh, I've read that no plays are always presented in the season they represent. Spring, summer, winter, and fall. I suggest this play be produced in January, in October, in any month except December. <laughs> um, I'm going to start us off tonight. Uh, there's only one line from the ghost of Stephen, and then I'll leave the stage to you. <laughs> <clears throat> the ghost of Stephen enters. The man and woman, the two narrators, enter and sit beside a musician. The three look at each other for a beat. They share a common breath. And then they commence, Ghost of Stephen. It was a very cold Christmas in a long and cold winter, decades and days ago. On the out outskirts of Washington, D.C., inside the Beltway. Concrete frozen with ice and stalled cars. A cold winter. It was not that cold. It was damp. It was freezing. I've gone through winters in New Orleans worse. It's the damp that chills you. Colder than Times Square on New Year's. Colder than the monuments on the mall. Colder than Washingtonians at a cocktail it's party. It's the damp. It was fucking freezing frigid. As frigid as... It was a cold Christmas that year. On their way to the grandparents' apartment, the family of five inched their way along the surface roads in a filthy rambler. 
father, mother, daughters, and son. The children hunched in the back, shivering and carsick, the wrapped presents piled in the trunk. The car smelled of stale cigarettes. Cigarette smoke wafted on the currents of heat cranking from the rambler's vents. The boy broke the silence first. Mama, I'm gonna be sick. The father kept driving, lurching the car forward with the right foot on the accelerator, a spastic, uneven tempo. The father grew up in Manhattan. He would never learn how to master a car. Mama, I'm going to be sick. Christ, the father said. How can he be sick? He hasn't eaten today. The mother turned from her front seat and with a practiced eye looked at the pallor of her son's skin. With a critical eye, she appraised the frown, the irritation on her husband's face. Her husband had his good days and his bad days, and today would be... Open the window on your side. Breathe in the cold air. A sliver of... A sliver of ice and air rushed through the car, the smell of damp wool coats and faint sweet car sickness from last summer's trip through the mountains ran out of the crack of the window. For a moment, the family breathed in deeply. <sighs> Rebecca, the eldest, said to her brother Stephen in a voice so low it could not be heard in the front, Don't breathe on me, puke breath. And she accompanied it with a sharp jab. Stephen pressed up to the glass and let the smooth chill caress his cheek. Claire, the youngest, chimed in next. If you're going to throw up, do it on your clothes this time. The mother glanced at her husband. Ray, maybe we should pull over. And in a voice too low to be heard in the back, her husband muttered, maybe we should just go home. We go through this every year, please. It's Christmas. And Rebecca chorused from the back. Mom, Daddy, he's going to spew. Do I have to sit in the back with these children? Do you want me to stop or not? We're late. Rebecca pleaded one more time. Can I please sit up front with you, Daddy? No one responded in the front. And the father pressed on the pedal, rocking the car, skidding forward, right, then left, then back, then forward. The mother gripped the car seat. Then she commanded, Stephen, roll down the window and stick your head out. And as they traveled, a rambler piled with gifts the head of a small boy hanging from its side, the rhythmic whip of tire chains in the ice and snow made the children dance and lulled them into a Christmas reverie. Rebecca, the eldest, thought of the red-faced boy she would not see until school begins. She thought of the wisp of hair that hung in his eyes. She thought of the bulge in his trousers she should not think of. And Claire thought of the turkey browning in the oven and thought of the sliver of breast and thigh her grandfather would serve her. On her own china plate, Claire whispered the names of all the food she would eat. Cranberry, oyster dressing resplendent with sage and celery. Gravy and mashed potatoes, onion and... Olive relish and gravy and turkey and two kinds of pie. As Claire's stomach ached. His stomach ached. So Stephen tried not to think of the turkey, the thick, rich foods, the gravy, the onions. Oh, God. <laughs> he felt his gorge rising. He bit his lip. He tried to think of something else. Rebecca exploded in the back seat. Shut up! And kicked her sister. He's going to toss all over me. Mom! Daddy! Why do I have to be nursemaid to these children? I want to sit up front. Neither of her parents noticed. Think, Stephen, of something else. He pictured the boys from school racing on the field. It always made him happy and sad to watch them. A blur of shorts and flesh and the spinning orb of the ball. The red-faced boys, the thin legs kicking. And his stomach fluttered, his breath caught. Dizzy, he clutched the door. Was he bad for watching boys? Think, Stephen, of something else without heat and motion. He thought of snow and ice and snow, and ice, and snow. And as they thought of the pleasures of the table, the pleasures of the tree, the pleasures of the flesh, the mother thought perhaps she should have an affair to feel the heat and motion of a man's body against hers. And the father tried not to think of Sheila. But did she like the cashmere? Would she wear the silver and turquoise pendant swinging towards her breasts? the cream of her breasts marking the brown of her skin and the perfume he had bought? When would he be able to breathe in the perfume dabbled in the sliver of her thigh? When could he see her? He must see her. He must talk with her. He must devour her. He could not sleep. Sheila, 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 Sheila. And the mother said to her husband softly, Penny for your thoughts.
The husband was startled to find his wife's hand nestled in his own. He drew his hand back to the steering wheel. Who can think in this family? And he said in a voice so low in the front seat it could not be heard in the back, I can't breathe in this family. He must think I'm retarded. Does he think I do not know where he is on his so-called business trips? When she was a much younger wife, she had tracked her husband to motel rooms where she would stand outside the window while he consorted with his lovers inside. She no longer followed his trail of evidence. Who had the time? He had slept with half the wives in church, possibly the minister's wife herself. And her husband said, I may need to visit a client tomorrow. And the mother smiled a thin, brittle smile. The man from the grocery last week had looked at her legs when she turned to get the money, up and down her legs. The children were out, her husband at work. How simple it would be to lead him up the stairs, put his hands on her breasts, plunge her hands down his trousers, and tumble onto the bed she made up every morning. And in the aftermath, as he pulled on his pants, he might say, Lady, your husband's a fool. And Claire rocked in anticipation of the gifts. Would she find what she had asked for under the tree today? She'd ask for cowboy boots and cowboy guns, blazing six shooters to conquer the West. She had not noticed a slight crease in her mother's brow, a concern, a question too soon to be asked. And the mother thought, he's in deep this time. The mother knew exactly who she was, the new woman in church, Sheila Jackson with a husband and a daughter in a hearth of her own. She wondered if her husband had money left over from the gifts her husband had bestowed. On that woman. Jewish men. Love their children, invest their money, never drink. Jewish men. Obey the ninth commandment. Revere their shiksa wives. Of all the Jewish men in the world, she had to marry this one. The mother sighed and her breath frosted the window. I should get pregnant again. Perhaps another child will end this infatuation. Surely he would not leave me then. And the chains called out the rhyme and the melody. And the father thought, when would he be able to breathe in the perfume? And Rebecca thought, when could she call the boy at school? And the mother thought, tomorrow night would be a good time to try. And Stephen never wondered what lay in the brightly colored boxes in the trunk, the presents and ribbons under the tree, because he already knew what each held inside. Disappointment. But it smelled like Christmas on the air. It was that time again. Christmas day was passing into night. The light had left the sky early, and he forgot his sickness. Stephen watched the lights of other Christmas trees and other houses flashing by. Icicles edged the gutters. While reindeer raced across suburban lawns, the house on the corner blinked, 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 blinked. Stephen's thoughts returned to last night, the lights and music in the church. Christmas Eve at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Rock Springs. The family entered the church together in a flock. As they drew off their coats, the mother spied the Jackson family. Hearty smiles were exchanged across the room. The adulterer and the cuckold, the martyred and the married. Merry, Merry Christmas! Christmas. <laughs> Ray! Bob! Sheila! Susie! Kate! Kids! Only Stephen noticed his mother stiffen. He took her side. You look beautiful tonight, Mama, Stephen said. And that is how the term Mama's Boy got made. The mother smiled and pressed her son, her only boy, to her side. Other families crowded in the vestibule. Husbands exerted slight and subtle pressure on their wives' arms to steer them away from their father, Ray. A coolness in the greetings that sang across the vestibule. Merry Christmas, Ray. Kate, to all. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas.